Hello, welcome to Clink Bible Study this Wednesday. Should we give a word of prayer? Dear Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you we can come into your presence. We thank you we can study your word. We thank you have revealed to us in your word everything that we need to have a relationship with you is real, to know who you are and to live for you and to serve you and to know you and love you as we should do. So help us to listen to your word and we pray this evening, Lord, that through your Holy Spirit, you will speak into our hearts and our lives. Please forgive and remove all is wrong. We thank you for the amazing relationship we have with you in Christ Jesus, our Saviour, your only begotten Son, who has paid the price in full. And we thank you for the wonder of our salvation. And we pray, Lord, this evening, that you'll make the significance and importance of this more real in our lives. For Jesus' sake alone. Amen. For the last two weeks, We've looked at how God spoke to Ab Ahab and Jezebel, despite their evil plans, despite their lifestyles, despite the rebellion and rejection of God. God spoke to them through the drought, as you remember, for three and a half years. God spoke to them through Elijah's straight messages. God spoke to them through the uselessness of Baal, and he couldn't answer prayer and he couldn't send rain. God spoke to them through the fire from heaven. God spoke to them through the rain that came in answer to prayer. And God spoke to him for the two victories over Syria. Impossible victories when their enemy completely outnumbered them. We've also seen God's patience and mercy, haven't we? God's patience and mercy to a man and his wife who in their rebellion and sin didn't deserve God's freedom, didn't deserve to be saved from the Syrians. Yet God in his grace, although there was no reason for them to have to, God to have to deliver him, he saved Israel and Syria twice, didn't he? Often, again and again, we read of God's unconditional love and God's grace being displayed to people that don't deserve it. Ahab had seen all that God had done. He'd heard all that Elijah said. He'd see God answer the prayer. He was without excuses. Yet still... His heart is unchanged. He takes those blessings, but he never once changed in Ahab, anything in Ahab's life to do with his relationship with God. So finally, in the life of Ahab, we come to 1 Kings chapter 21. And if we looked at 1 Kings chapter 21, we read in the first two verses these words. It came to pass after these things that Nabal, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel next to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard, that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it's near and next to my house. And for it in exchange, I'll give you a vineyard that's better. Or if it seems good to you, I'll give you its worth in money. So Ahab the king was offering to buy a vineyard that's next to his palace, belonging to Uncle Naboth. Ahab has plans to extend his palace. He wants a herb garden built, home of gardens beside his palace. Yeah, plans. We all make plans about what we'd like to do to our gardens, perhaps, or our homes, and how we'd like to extend this or improve that. And so he makes Naboth his offer. Humanly, it was a fair offer. He offered him another vineyard, a better one, or he offered him its wealth for money, value of money. And that's a tempting offer. Humanly, it was fair, it was a good deal. But Naboth's reply is no. Listen to verse 3. Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. Why did Naboth say no? Well, unlike Ahab, Naboth obviously did love and fear God. When Israel was given the land by God in the days of Joshua, when they first went to the promised land, the whole land was divided up into different areas of different tribes. And within those tribal areas, each family had its own inheritance, its own part of land. And the land they were given was their inheritance. And it was passed from one generation to another generation. If you remember in the story of Ruth, the time when they went to, her in-laws went down to Moab, when Naomi come back, their land and their inheritance had been taken over by someone else. And it had to be bought back. That's why Boaz stepped in and bought it back. Because that belonged to her family. He was buying it back for their family. And so this inheritance was passed, it had been passed in generations all the way from the days of Joshua, right the way through to Ahab's day. From one generation to the next generation, 
in those days, most people lived off the land they owned. So that was their lifeline. That's where they grew their food. It's where they fed their animals. It's where they grazed their animals. That was what most of them needed to live. So this vineyard was actually the inheritance that belonged to Nabal's family. It had been there since the beginning. And Nabal said, no, it's not mine to sell. It belongs to my family. It was given us from God. Ahab as king should have known that. And he probably did know that. But Ahab has no fear of God, does he? No respect for God's law. We've already seen this. He has no respect for Israel as God's people. He thinks of his people that follow and do what he wants to do. And basically, Ahab has asked, Naboth replied, that should have been the end of the story, shouldn't it? But no. Look at verse 4. Ahab went to his house sullen and displeased, because the word which Naboth, the Jezreelite, had spoken to him, for he had said, I will not give you inheritance of my father's. And he lay down in his bed. He turned away his face and would eat no food. But Jezebel's wife came to him and said to him, Why is your spirit so sullen that you eat no food? He said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth, the Jezreelite, and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money. Or else it pleases you, I'll give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. I have sulks. Sulking is something we normally associate with children. We call it babyish behaviour, don't we? But you know, grown-ups do it as well. There's times when we all have a bit of hissy fit and a hump, get a hump because we can't have our own way. And Ahab sulks. He refuses to eat. He lies in his bed and he turns his face to the wall and won't talk to anyone. So Jezebel goes along and asks why. And Ahab tells her. Now, why did Ahab just sulk? Why didn't Ahab actually just force Naboth out his vineyard? Somewhere in Ahab's mind, there's a glimmer of conscience still, isn't there? Somewhere in Ahab's mind, still, there's a glimmer of what's right and what's wrong. And he knows it. this is overstepping the mark. And as much as he wants that vineyard, he can't have it. So he sulks because deep down, he's still got a bit of a conscience. Jezebel doesn't. Look at verse 7. Jezebel, his wife, said to him, You now exercise authority over Israel. Arise, eat food. Let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. Jezebel has no conscience. She says, you're king. Come on, you're the one with the authority and the power. Just take it. And then she puts the look to the Don't worry. You sit up, get up and eat. I'll take it for you. I'll do it. I'll get you the vineyard. And just note how Jezebel does this. Beginning in verse 8. She wrote letters to Ahab's name sealed them with his seal, and sent the letters to the elders and the nobles who were dwelling in the city with Naboth. And she wrote in the letters, saying, Proclaim a fast. Seat Naboth for high honour amongst the people. Seat two men, scoundrels, before him to bear witness against him, saying, You blaspheme God and the king. Then take him out and stone him that he may die. So the men of the city, the elders and the nobles who were inhabitants of the city, did as Jezebel had sent to them, as it was written in the letters which she had sent to them. They proclaimed a fast and seated Naboth for high honour among the people. And two men, scoundrels, came in and sat before him. And the scoundrels witnessed against Naboth in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth has blasphemed God and the king. And they took him outside the city, and they stoned him with stones, so that he died. And then he sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth has been stoned and is dead. What does she do? She uses others. Others that were scared and intimidated by her to do her dastardly deed, to do her evil plan, to fulfil what she wants to do. It's almost like she hides the evidence, the paper trail that goes back to her. She first of all, she signs the letters in Ahab's name rather than her own, but I'm pretty sure the elders of the city knew who'd signed that letter really. They knew the, the way that was worded and that when she's time to do something, that was really an open-ended threat. And if they didn't do it, they themselves would end up on her hit list. So the elders of the city, in fear and intimidation, do what she tells her, tells them to do. She even uses God in his name to get rid of Naboth. Accuse Naboth of what do not blaspheming against God. She doesn't even believe in God. She hates God. She's killed God's prophet. If anyone has committed blasphemy, it's Jezebel. But here she's twisting and manipulating what she knows will hit the moral radar. To get rid of the person she wants to get rid of. It's so ironic, isn't it? And the plan works. 
Naboth's accused of blasphemy against the God that he obviously loves. In anger, the crowd turn on him and stone him, egged on by the leaders of the city, who were obviously scared of Jezebel if he didn't do what she wanted. And based on those lies, Jezebel's evil plan and scheme works. The self-righteous people of the city kill an innocent man to fulfill Jezebel's plans. It seems untraceable back to Jezebel and Ahab, doesn't it? It looks like this man just did it. All the evidence seems to point to a lynch mob getting rid of him because they're moved with anger and justice in what he so-called said. There was no inquiry, there was no fair trial, there was nothing. And so we come to verse 15. It came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth had stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, for he's refused to give you the money. For Naboth is not alive but dead. So it was that when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, Ahab got up. He went down to take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. As Jezebel tells Ahab, he suddenly stops sulking, like a little child has got his own way. And he goes to claim the vineyard. But what about Naboth's family? Surely they live there as well, but I suppose they're just turfed out. There's no justice here. There's nothing fair here about Ahab and Jezebel's plans. It seems like today that the political, powerful men and women do whatever they want and they get away with it. There's a question, this is a question that always seems to be there. It always has been. On the Psalms, Psalm 73, the Psalms writing that Psalm struggle with the same question. He really struggled with why people seem to do wicked, evil things and get away with it. Because they're powerful and no, they seem untouchable. Listen to what he says in Psalm 73, verse 1. Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. I was envious of the boastful when I saw how pros this prosperity of the wicked. There's no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They're not in trouble like other men, not plague like other men. Therefore pride serves as a necklace. The violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They seem to have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore, his people return here and the waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are the ungodly. They're always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I've cleansed my hands in vain. I've washed my hands in innocence. And all day long I've been plagued and chastened every morning. If I said I would speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. Injustice, corruption, the rich are untouchable. That's what the psalmist is saying here. No one seems to be there for the poor and the downtrodden. And to faithfully, loyally serve God doesn't mean that you have no problems but somehow you still seem to struggle but they seem to sail through life with no problems whatsoever but then the psalmist went to worship God and they start to look at things in a completely different perspective he saw their end he saw the judgment on sin from a holy just God listen again verse 17 of Psalm 73 until I went into the house of God then I understood their end Surely, Lord, you've set them in slippery places. you cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they're brought to desolation in a moment. They're utterly consumed with terrors as a day when one awakes. So, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. My heart was grieved and I was vexed in my mind. I had been so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. But nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterwards you will receive me to glory. Who have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon the earth I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. The psalmist saw their end. And he realised a life lived without God, a life lived in rebellion to God, is not a life worth living. He knew one day they would pay the price in full for a just and holy God for their sin. He knew 
that he had a relationship with God that was real. It doesn't mean all his problems have gone away. But through trusting in God's forgiveness and trusting in God as his Lord and Saviour, the psalmist knew, he said, Lord, you're always with me. I've got something. The rich, powerful, arrogant, evil rulers of this world and the mighty men that seem to do what they want don't have. They may look like they've got it all. The reality is they've got nothing. They've got nothing and one day they'll stand before God in their sin and be answerable to him for every mistake they've made. Naboth's faith in God meant Naboth had something that Ahab never had. Like the psalmist here, he had a relationship with God that was real. It didn't take him out of his problems. But the psalm said there that, Lord, you're always with me. And one day when this life is over, you will take me to be with you forever in glory of heaven. And you will never fail me. Who do I need in life but you? The answer is no one. And it was Naboth's faith in God here. Yes, as those stones rained down on Naboth and he died for, accused of an injustice with his family name in shame. He wasn't abandoned by the God that loved him. And the God that made him and the God that he trusted in. The God, he paid the price for standing up for what was right. He paid the price for acknowledging that God had given him that land as an inheritance. He had a relationship that was for life and beyond into heaven. A relationship which causes all this world offers to pale in nothing. God does see. God is just and he will judge every sin and fa just failing perfectly and justly. And the only way outside of that judgment and justice is for it being paid by someone else in our place. And we know, don't we, that the only person that could pay and, our, and give us justice was the person that faced justice instead of us. It was Jesus, God's son on them. But outside of God's forgiveness in Christ at Calvary, which obviously in the Old Testament time is signified and pictured and represented by those Old Testament sacrifices. Outside that sacrifice of forgiveness, there is no other payment for sin. The wages of sin is death. It's only through God's gift as a sacrifice in our place that we are forgiven and saved. After all God's mercy, after all God's blessings, yet still Ahab and Jezebel sin as seen by God. And now God speaks to Ahab once again. Back there in 1 Kings chapter 21 again. Verse 17. The Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise and go to meet Ahab, the king of Israel, who lives in Samaria. There he is, in the vineyard in Naboth, which he's gone down to take possession of. You shall speak to him, Thus says the Lord, Have you murdered and taken possession? And you shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, In the place where the dogs lick the blood of Naboth, dogs shall lick your blood, even yours. Elijah is sent to Ahab with a message from God again. God who saw everything and there are no excuses in God's sight. It's Ahab's sin. He's a murderer. Murderer. He is a thief here, isn't he? The city leaders are not accused. Even Jezebel's name is not mentioned originally here. The sin started with Ahab. You know, in the Bible when it talks about coveting a sin it never seems a very bad sin does it that last sin the tenth commandment thou shalt not cover but it's usually the springboard for murder adultery rebellion stealing it's a springboard for a lot of the other laws to be broken and this is where it started it started with Ahab coveting something that wasn't his and when the answer was no he carried on coveting and it led to murder. It led to lies, didn't it? It led to theft. Because of his sin, Ahab will die. Is the message that Elijah's got to deliver. And so will his family. Jezebel is going to be eaten by dogs. Ahab's family face a grim, violent end. Listen to what's said in verse 20. Ahab said to Elijah, have you found me, my enemy? And Elijah said, I found you. You sold yourself to do evil on the sight of the Lord. Behold, I'll bring calamity on you. I'll take away your prosperity. I'll cut off Mayab, every male in Israel, bond and free. I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basa, the son of Athaliah, I'm sorry, Ahijah, because of the provocation with which you have provoked me to anger and made Israel sin. And concerning Jezebel, the Lord said, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. 
and the dogs shall eat whoever belongs to Ahab and dies in the city, and the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the field. God is promising here that the whole of Ahab's family are going to meet violent, evil, death, bad deaths. They're told here that the dogs are going to lick the blood of Ahab. In the same place they licked the blood of Naboth. Dogs in Bible times were not pets, they were scavengers. They scavenged around the dumps and the tips on the edge of town, just like foxes do very often today. Obviously a lot bolder. He said here that whoever dies in a city, they're going to die violent deaths. And the carcasses are just going to be left to rot and the dogs are going to eat them. And who dies in the field, they're not going to be buried nicely. They're going to be left in the field and the crows and the vultures are going to come down and pet them. We're told here that dogs will actually eat Jezebel. And twice there, it's compared to Basil's family and Jeroboam's family. Now, both those families were the two that were assassinated and wiped out when there was military coups in the country we looked at a few weeks ago. The whole of Ahab's family line, his royal line, is going to be wiped out. There is not going to be a survivor. Let's remind ourselves who Ahab is then. Verse 25. There was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord, because Jezebel's wife stirred him up. He behaved very abominably in following idols, according to all that the Amorites did, and the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Ahab is evil. He is facing the just resort of what he's done. He's stirred up, encouraged by his wife Jezebel. But what is Ahab thinking now? He's had this message, this condemning conviction from God here. Verse 27. So it was that when Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes and he put on sackcloth on his body. And he fasted and he lay in sackcloth and went around mourning. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, See now, Ahab has humbled himself before me. Because he's humbled himself before me, I will not bring the calamity in his days. In the days of his son, I will bring the calamity on his house. Ahab shows remorse here. He shows humility. Something you never thought you'd see from Ahab. He shows remorse here for his sins before God. God sees and God tells Elijah that the bloodshed of Ahab's family will not happen until after Ahab's died. So we will be spared seeing their suffering. But is this Ahab turning to God? Is Ahab repenting here and asking God's forgiveness? After all, what does 1 John 1 verse 9 say if we confess our sins? He's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But this is not Ahab asking for forgiveness. He has regrets. He shows remorse. To be sorry doesn't mean you're forgiven. You can be sorry that you got caught. Doesn't mean you're actually saying sorry for what you've done wrong, does it? Judas had regrets. So did Cain back at the dawn of history. But neither of them found forgiveness because they didn't come to God on his terms and his way. If you remember, that was the whole problem of Cain in the story of Cain and Abel. He didn't come on God's terms to cover sins as a forerunning picture of what Jesus was going to do on the cross. They had to bring a sacrifice of a lamb or a perfect animal. Cain bought vegetables, gave God the rubbish. He couldn't be bothered to do the right thing. He came his way, not God's way. And the only way to find forgiveness is to come God's way. Cain never came God's way. Abel did. Abel found forgiveness because he came God's way. And the blood of that lamb covered his sins as it pointed forward to what Jesus would do at Calvary. Judas hung himself, unable to live with the guilt. But Peter, in comparison, found forgiveness through Jesus. And here, Ahab Humility and regrets were real. But to be forgiven, you have to come on God's terms in God's way. And Ahab never did that. He never once, even though he goes around sackcloth and ashes and he mourns what's happened, he never once hear of him coming to Elijah and saying, can you pray to God for me? Coming and offering a sacrifice to God. He never once hear of him actually turning to God and cast himself on God's mercy and forgiveness, do you? And without Christ, without that sacrifice, there is no forgiveness of sin. Listen to Galatians. 
the Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you will reap. He who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. You pay, I pay, for our actions and what we do. And when you look at this story here, you see the same and you realise the only reason you and I will go to heaven one day is if we are trusting Christ who has paid the price in our place. Without him, we pay for those sins and those sins condemn us in eternity and in God's judgment. Yeah, but so into the wind, he's reaping a whirlwind. After all God's mercy and grace, Ahab's heart has remained unmoved and unchanged, and now he's facing God's judgment, fair and just. Ahab and Jezebel are without excuse. Like we read in Romans chapter 1 last week, there is no excuse after all they had seen. In the following chapter, chapter 22, Ahab goes to war. Ahab, along with Jehoshaphat, the godly king of Judah. We just looked at the story in the life of Jehoshaphat a few weeks ago. But just turn to 1 Kings 22 verse 29 and read what happens. The king of Israel, that's Ahab, and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel, that's Ahab, said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go into battle, but you put on your robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. Deep down, I believe, we reckon, that he probably thought, you know, be careful here. Remember what Elijah said. I don't want to die. They're going to bound the target at me because I'm the king. I'm going to go in disguise. I'll let Jude, the king of Judah dress as a king and go to battle his crown on, his posh armour. I'll just dress as an ordinary soldier. And if anyone gets targeted, it'll be him, not me. He thought he could run from God. He thought he could hide from judgment. He thought he could get away and escape, paying the price that he deserved to pay. He'd been told by a prophet he was going to die in that battle. And he thought he could run and hide from God. But there's nowhere you can go to run and hide from God. He sees everything. In the judgment day, we're told our people will call on the rocks to hide them. But nothing can hide you from God's judgment other than the blood of Jesus Christ, his only son. Nothing else. So what happens? Verse 31. The king of Syria commanded the 32 captains of his chariots, saying, Fight with no one small or great except the king of Israel. So it was when the captains of chariots saw Jehoshaphat, they said, surely it's the king of Israel. And they turned aside to fight against him. And Jehoshaphat cried out. And it happened that when the captains of the chariots saw that it was not the king of Israel, that they turned back from pursuing him. And a certain man drew a bow at random. And he fired an arrow in the air and it struck the king of Israel between the joints of his armour. So he said to his chariot driver, turn around and take me out of battle. And the battle increased that day. And the king was propped up in his chariot facing the Syrians. And he died at evening. The blood ran out of the wound on the floor of the chariot. As the sun was going down, a shout went out for the army, every man to his city, every man to his own country. So the king died. And they brought him to Samaria. And they buried the king of Samaria. And someone washed the chariot at the pool of Samaria. And the dogs licked up his blood. While the harlots bathed, according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken. And the rest of the acts of Ahab and all he did. The ivory house which he built and the cities which he built are not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel. And Ahab rested with his fathers and Ahaziah his son reigned in his place. Ahab's attempt to hide from God is futile. The Syrians, just remember the Syrians were the ones last week that Ahab let escape. God warned him this was going to happen and now used by God to fulfil God's judgement on Ahab. A random arrow finds a gap, a chink in his armour. No one was even aiming the arrow, just fired it in the air and it so happened to be guided by God. God's judgment is always fair and you can't hide or escape from the judgment of God. Found that gap in the armour and it pierced, went straight through. And by the evening he dies. The puddle of blood in the bottom of his chariot is washed out and just as Elijah had said, the dogs lick up his blood. A generation later, Elisha had sent a prophet, Elisha, sorry, had sent a prophet to anoint a man called Jehu to be the next king of Israel. And Jehu kills off the rest of Ahab's family. Jehu kills Ahab's son. Jehu kills off his extended family. He even destroys the worship of Baal and all the Baal worshippers. And just as God promised in, a, in regard to Jezebel, we read in 2 Kings chapter 9 verse 30. When Jezebel, Jehu came to Jezebel, Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it and she put paint on her eyes and adorned her head and looked for the window. 
And as Jehu entered the gate, she said, Is it peace, Jehu, murderer of your master? And he looked up at the window and said, Who's on my side? Who? And two or three eunuchs looked out at him. He said, Throw her down. And they threw Jezebel out the window. And some of her blood splattered on the wall and on the horses. And he trampled her under the foot of his horses. And when he had gone in, he ate and drank. And he said, Go out and see the accursed woman and bury her because she's a king's daughter. So they went to bury her, but they didn't find her. All that was left was her skull and her feet and her hands. And they came back in and told him. And he said, this is the word of the Lord. He spoke by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying on the pot of ground at Jezreel, dogs will eat the flesh of Jezebel and the corpse of Jezebel shall be as a refuge on the surface of the field in the plot of Jezreel. So they, so they shall not say, here lies Jezebel. There was nothing left of her. The dogs ate her. Jezebel meets possibly the most gruesome and horrific, degrading death of them all. Ahab and Jezebel set out to deny God and God's law, to wipe out God's name and worship of God in Israel. They use violence and force to achieve their plans. But you can't fight against God and win. God is building his church and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Just unholy God showed undeserved grace to Jezebel and Ahab again and again so that they could truly see that the Lord is God. But they rejected the gift of God. And if you reject the gift of God, then the wages of sin are yours to pay, justly and fairly. Today and throughout history, God has revealed his power in creation. God has revealed his will and law in his word, the Bible. God has displayed his love and the way of salvation in Christ Jesus. God so loved this world that he gave his only son. There are believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But then read that man chose darkness rather than light in John 3. Because his deeds are evil, he doesn't want to come to the light. He rejects it. He chooses the dark. Man chooses darkness. He sees the light, but he doesn't want it. Ahab saw the light. Jezebel saw the light. They didn't want it. And this reminds us how we must faithfully preach and witness to a lost, rebellious world that doesn't want to come to the light of our God, of his mercy, of his grace, of our sin before him, of our need of Christ to face, to face judgment and justice in our place for us. For to reject Christ is to face God in our sin and face the righteous judgment that we deserve because there's no one else to stand in our place. Does this drive us to our knees as Christians tonight in prayer before God for those who do not know Christ's salvation? They know of it. They know about it. Ahab knew about it. He knew of it. But it meant nothing to them. And it's only the God's Holy Spirit that can transform their lives. Jesus wept over lost sinners and rebellious hard hearts when he was in this world. Are we moved like Christ? Are we moved like Elijah to pray for our nation, to pray for our families and our friends and those that do not know Christ? That God in his mercy will speak to them. That through the Holy Spirit they'll be brought to a saving knowledge of a saviour that we know and love and know that their sins are forgiven, not because they deserve it, but for that perfect sacrifice of Jesus in their place. I want to read you the words of the hymn as we close tonight. Pause my soul and ask the question, are you ready to meet God? Am I really a real Christian? Am I washed in the Redeemer's blood? Have I union with the church's living head? Am I quickened by his spirit? Living a life of faith and prayer, trusting wholly in his merit, Casting on him all my care, daily longing in his likeness to appear. If my hope on Christ is stayed, let him come when he thinks best. O oh, my soul, do not be dismayed. Lean upon his loving breast. He will cheer you with the smilings of his face. But if you are still a total stranger to his precious name in blood, you are on the brink of danger. Can you face a holy God? Think and tremble. Death is now upon the road. Shall we pray? Dear Lord God, I thank you for the solemn message once more. This solemn warning we see in the life of Ahab and Jezebel. They lived without you. They rejected your salvation. They rejected your lordship. They died without you. 
and they face an eternity without you. Lord, make the reality of this more real to us, that this life is only scratching the surface compared to eternity. Move us with a compassion and love for those which do not know you, that live in rebellion to you, rejection of you. Lord, that you would open their eyes and bring them to a saving knowledge of yourself. You will do what only you can do. Salvation is your work, not ours. And we pray that we'll faithfully pray. We pray that we'll faithfully witness. But we pray, O oh Lord God, that you will hear and that you will answer. For Jesus' precious sake alone. Amen.